Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing um, voting. The title is Voting is Begging for Stolen Goods from my blog post by the same name. Many of us were taught in our government schools that voting is our civic duty and that it is the way we exercise who we believe should be governing us. I will make the case that voting is at best a suggestion box that slaves use to pitifully beg their political masters for more scraps from the table and at worst a violent intent to use the guns of the state to further one's moral self-righteousness. Assuming voting has any useful effect on the outcome, the very essence of democracy is that through voting, the majority can forcefully impose their will on the rest of the population regardless of individual rights. It is a disgusting intent to delegate to politicians the criminal act of robbing one's neighbors that one is too cowardly to do oneself. This is typical lynch mob morality and is nothing to be proud of. The group does not possess moral virtues that is absent in the individual. In fact, historically it is shown that people in groups act with much more blatant brutality, barbarism, and insanity than they otherwise would act individually of their own devices. Some may point out well, we don't live in a democracy. We live in a republic. This may be true, but cite me an enduring example in history when a republic or any form of government has ever respected individual rights or property rights regardless of worthless constitutions and bill of rights. You would be hard pressed to find such an example. It is more likely that voting is a useless plea to our rulers, hoping in vain that they return some of the currency they stole from us, re recover some of the rights they trampled over, lessen the economic destruction wreaked on the, on the market by their interventionist policies, or restore some of the stolen prosperity that fiat currency plunders from the unborn. Ask the black slave of the American South during the early 19th century if they believed working within the system was a useful method for change. One would sooner see unicorns jump over rainbows than reasonably expect politicians to reduce their power over the multitude. This prospect is simply not in the realm of the sane. Do not delude yourselves into believing you have a choice. The choice of what color the boot is that is stamping on your face is not the type of choice one should be proud of making. Do not participate in this farce. It only invalidates you as a human being and brings you down to the level of sociopaths. To ask for permission to be free is an open admission that you are not free. Recognize no man as your master. You are your own master. I end with a quote by Charles Bukowski. The difference between a democracy and a dictatorship is that in a democracy, you vote first and take orders later. In a dictatorship, you don't have to waste your time voting. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> voting. One of the uh, cornerstones of those who advocate for government as being a, a symbol that we the people um, participate or control our elected officials. You know, they, we call them public officials or public servants, which is kind of a ridiculous notion because... Uh, what kind of servant can realistically um, rob, assault, rape, 
or murder you or imprison you um, against your consent, right? If you're truly uh, in charge, if you are truly the master and government is the servant, how is it possible that all these people have had their lives destroyed who were victims of uh, the injustice system? You know, did they do it to themselves? Or what about the, uh, you know, the Jews? That was a, they had a constitution, Nazi Germany. They had a Bill of Rights. They could vote. I guess they just, since they were the government, they killed themselves, right? They committed suicide, right? Because we are the government, right? Of course not. Um, there is a clear distinction between the people and government. Clear distinction, right? Um, government has special rights that the people do not have. We call these sovereign immunity or legal plunder, right? The government may rob the people and call it taxation, right? The government may kidnap people, call it the draft or indefinite detention. The government may put people in a cage and call it prison. The government may um, murder people overseas and call it the war on terror. Um, the government may <laughs> spy on its citizens and call it surveillance. So um, there's clearly a distinction as well as, you know, <laughs> do you know anybody who who decided how much money to borrow from the Federal Reserve last month? Do you know anybody who decided what the wording on the Patriot Act would be? Or how about the Affordable Care Act? Anybody uh, write that? You know, you know of anybody who wrote that? <laughs> of course not. We are clearly separate, entirely separate from government. And voting is um, only something that gives people the illusion of control, the illusion that by begging, by entreating our political masters, we can make a choice in our own tyranny, in our own subjugation. So there's a level of uh, questioning that was, um, that's championed by Larkin Rose that clearly illustrates the illegitimacy of government and that the phrase consent of the governed is quite a um, um, oxymoronic phrase. Um, so, basically, can you delegate to another person a right you do not have? Let's say murder. Murder is wrong. We can't murder people, right? Can I delegate the right to murder to someone else? And does that make it right? No. Can you delegate to 100 people? No. How about, how about a thousand people? No. How about a million? Right? Is there any point where the laws of morality do not apply to people? And if not, well, if you answer yes, then you could be a sociopath <laughs> um, in the closet. Um, and you may not know it. Or the person you, you're talking to may be such a person. Um, but if you answered no, you, like most other people, understand that morality is a golden rule applied to everyone. There is no exceptions to morality. No exemptions. Okay? So we have to apply this principle un universally. We cannot delegate to someone else a right that we do not have ourselves. And <clears throat> so consent of the governed is oxymoronic because if we all gave consent, then that means that we were all present, let's say during the signing of the Constitution, right? Everyone signed it, all right? And that's not the case, right? It was, it was uh, a piece of paper that was drafted in secrecy behind closed doors. You know, white slave masters um, drafted it and gave themselves 
the power of government, the power to levy taxes, the power to imprison those who um, resisted, those who refused to obey, those who refused to bow down. Right, so <clears throat> you can imagine the um, American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence that followed was, in a sense, a very anarchist document <clears throat> outlining um, our independence from Great Britain. However, uh, in those intervening few years between that and the U.S. Constitution, um, <laughs> that was really the only time of true, I guess, you know, voluntary vo voluntarism or anarcho-capitalism in our in our history. Because once the U.S. Constitution was written and authorized. Um, they gave themselves the right to rob people through taxation and quell resistance. All of a sudden, it's no longer um, truly by the people or for the people because not all the people signed it, right? And if not all the people signed such a thing, how can it be ac applicable to all the people, right? They call this the social contract theory. Um, and you know what? Even if all the people at that time did sign it, well, the future generations, of course, did not sign it. So how could they be bound to a social contract, to any contract that they did not sign? Right? You, don't, you don't say that, you know, you, I fell out of my mother's uterus here, and so right, you, you're right next to me, so you have to pay taxes to me. No, that would be ensla you know, enslavement or indentured servitude against one's will. All right, so we, we would never respect a contract that people did not carefully read and sign beforehand um, other than the U.S. Constitution for some reason. That has a special distinction in most people's minds. So there is no such thing really as consent of the governed, okay? Maybe there's consent of the political elite, <laughs> and then the the violent carrying out of those threats by their willing attack dogs known as the police and the military right so voting is um, it's really basically the ability to choose is a Lysander Spooner a great quote it says uh, the ability to choose a new master every four to six years um, does not signify freedom. Something like that, I believe I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but um, the ability to choose a new master is not something that we should be proud of, okay? Because we really have no power over our politicians in any respect, all right? You know, we, we have a, um, there's a, a predetermined, uh, list of oppressors ready to rise up, take the throne of power, and enact new laws to further restrict human freedom, liberty, and trade. And we have no power over that. You know, we can protest, we can walk, march in the streets, um, and that's wonderful. However, at the same time, that is quite dangerous because that usually uh, um, brings, you know, attracts police and military to come and quell the protests, and they, you know, they... <laughs> then you get all the tear gas and you get all the you know arrests and everything like that so that it's not a way I recommend um, and neither is voting voting also so if if voting actually did work the whole idea of voting is itself immoral since what we're actually saying is that through a system of coercion each person has the ability to impose his will on his neighbor. So basically, um, you know, individual rights be damned. <laughs> if the majority of people vote for a particular thing, then it will be done. So if 99 people voted for me to be hung and I voted no for me not to be hung, guess what happens? And what kind of justice is that? Is that justice? Of course not. That's, that's lynch bomb mentality, lynch mob. Uh, and lynch mobs never 
uh, you know, historically are not comprised of, of uh, thinkers, authors, luminaries, philosophers. <laughs> Lynch mobs are typically comprised of angry, emotional, reptilian brain thinking type people. And is this the kind of is this the kind of people that you want to lead society anyway? If voting actually did matter, right? If uh, you know John, um, I think his name is uh, what's uh, John Taylor Gatto, the guy who was a public school teacher. He basically said that um, genius is as common as dirt, right? We're all geniuses. So individually, we're geniuses. As a group, we are. A, <laughs> a headless monster <laughs> just wreaking havoc throughout the land and through our voting in mass um, we are only demonstrating our idiocy and lunacy to our fellow man right? um, it is not something to be proud of to legitimize a violent and oppressive institution such as government. Um, <clears throat> so, so voting, you know, and, and you look at the other countries that have actually had the ability to vote, what, did it, what good did it do them, right? You, you had, you know, uh, I've stated this before, but it's never, uh, it can never be said often enough. Um, the countries that had a constitution and a bill of rights um, and you know, the ability to, to vote, to peacefully assemble and protest, the, you know, the right to bear arms, the right to uh, uh, trial by jury, you know, and all this crap. Some of the countries that have had such things include Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, Communist Red China, right, um, and Cambodia under Pol Pot, North Korea, until today and what was the outcome of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights do pieces of paper actually inhibit or restrict tyrants and dictators from coming to power of course not um, it's only the people that can restrict such things not pieces of paper and it doesn't matter if how long ago a piece of paper was written right um, it's not pieces of paper that make us free it's the people individually understanding the importance of property rights and self-ownership and non-aggression that makes a society free. It's the people that regularly contribute by doing the things they were most passionate and things that they were most skilled at doing and by that token increasing the general wealth of society. These are the ways that we can increase the human welfare in general um, <clears throat> not by voting voting only it's it's like playing their game it's legitimizing their oppression you know using the system <laughs> you know like I said um, ask a black slave in the south if working within the system was a correct thing to do and then ask Harriet Tubman <laughs> why did she build the Underground Railroad why did she why did she uh, establish all these intricate networks to smuggle black slaves to the free north because she openly recognized that there comes a point when working within the system is suicide is you know the the bureaucracy is just too great to overcome. It's too expensive. It's too cumbersome. And there's no time to waste. Every moment that's wasted is gone, right? Our lives are too short to be bowing down to our political masters, our control freaks, our authoritarian overlords. It's too short for begging. Right, <clears throat> voting is begging for stolen goods to be returned to us. It's a pitiful and disgraceful display. 
And the way Stefan Molyneux describes it was pretty accurate. It's like on a, you're on a playground and the bullies steal your candy. And then you go after the, one of them and then he throws it to the other bully. <laughs> and you go after the other one and he throws it to the other bully. And it's pitiful. It's disgraceful. And in the end, you just have to, you have to take a deep breath and stick your chest out and say, keep the candy. I don't want it anymore. I'm leaving. Don't play their game. That's not the way. Get out. It cannot continue without our participation. It requires our support, our attention. Without it, it's genuinely crippled. The power of the U.S. government is only supported by people who actually believe in the myth of authority, right? It is propagated by people who believe in the power of the government. See, that's kind of strange. <laughs> See, the, gov the power of the government doesn't actually exist, right? It only really exists in those people who actually believe it does exist and therefore go overseas and are willing to indiscriminately kill, subjugate, assault, rape, murder in the name of this amorphous entity known as the United States government. And, of course, get paid in stolen, stolen currency. And the police, domestically, are the domestic enforcers of government, right? They are entrusted to keep the people in check. And so, again, our politicians have power because we give them power. Where does power originate? This is another fascinating topic I, I have been thinking about. Where does power originate? Is it from the people with money? Is it from the CEOs? Is it from the White House? Congress, House of Representatives, the Senators, the Governors? Where does power originate? Now if you say that power originates in the White House with the President, the Oval Office, then you are basically ascribing him superhuman powers. <laughs> because he must be able, to, with a flick of his pen, with, with a wave of his hand, he must be able to bend society to his knees, to his tyrannical whims. But he's not superhuman. He's just a human being. He's just a man like all the others. And he is given power by the only people that can give it. Right? The industrious, the productive, the middle class, the people who constantly legitimize the authority of government, the people who constantly believe in the belief in the myth of authority. That is where power originates. It originates from the people. So it's not necessary to vote for a new master. It's not necessary <clears throat> to protest politicians when they displease you. All that's necessary to do is to recognize where power originates. And once you realize power originates with those people who actually believe, they hallucinate the belief in the myth of authority, then you realize that all it requires is the removal of our consent to being governed, the removal of our support and participation. That's all that requires. And all of these bureaucrats, these parasites, these politicians, governors, senators, these representatives, 
will lose power immediately. It requires our willing participation and, of course, our funding through taxation. Right again, people stop paying taxes, it's over. People stop using the dollar, it's over. The dollar hegemony is hinged upon people using it, which is why when foreign governments elect to trade in their own currencies or trade in gold or trade in oil, it is a direct threat to the power of the U.S. government, <laughs> a direct threat. Because once people stop using it, the demand goes down. Supply goes up, but demand goes down. And this is a very dangerous and precarious position for any government, especially one that is so imperialistic, genocidal, and murderous as the U.S. government. And we have been far too long the world reserve currency, a status that perhaps we deserved at some small point, but now it's, on, it's running on fumes. The gas is low, the tank is near empty. We're running on our reserves. China and India and Russia are buying gold and silver at astonishing rates. And all we can give people is paper, pieces of paper, fiat currency, Federal Reserve notes. That's all we have to offer people. That's all. Our manufacturing base, the people who actually produce the jobs, create the jobs, needed to sustain a powerful economy are leaving. They are leaving, expatriating, moving their businesses offshore into countries that are more economically friendly, tax havens. So the paradigm is shifting. Power is changing. Perhaps the United States was once the nuclear powerhouse, but now the trend is clear. It will not be so for very much longer. And when you're old and decrepit and hobbling around, hunched over, or perhaps not, if you don't get arthritis, <laughs> and your grandchildren come up to you and they ask you, Grandpa, where were you? when the US government was failing, when the US government was in its death throes, when it was flailing around for support and no one would lend it a hand because it had destroyed too many countries, killed too many people, trampled on the rights of its own citizens. Where were you in the fight for freedom and liberty? Were you on the side of the oppressors? Or were you on the side of the oppressed? And I want to be able to tell my kids that I was proud to say that I fought for what I thought would lead to the liberation of humanity. It is the people that always make change, <clears throat> strive for change, strive for improving the status quo, that are constantly vilified and demonized by those in power, the entrenched interests. So if you, in your daily life, in your works, in your writing, if you do not encounter resistance, if you do not encounter people angrily, disagreeing with you, if you don't anger some people along the way, then you're not doing a good enough job. 
we need to anger some people. Some people need to be uprooted. We live in a fascistic system that needs to be uprooted. And the best way and the most permanent way I can see is non-violently, non-cooperatively. Just <laughs> continue along the path towards voluntarism, towards agorism, support black markets, support freedom in all aspects. So I'm going to end right there. This is Peace Phonicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care.